Hello, and welcome to RHDS Music. My name is Rob Hart, and I've designed courses that I feel concentrate on the fundamentals of music, and that includes counting, note rates, hand and feet technique, groove independence, and much more. Please check me out at my website at robhartdrumstudio.com, and there you can sign up for free lesson previews, and you can sign up for my mailing list to get the latest information when it drops. What I've done here is I've compiled a series of different interviews I've done with music professionals, and I hope you get a lot out of these different interviews, and I know I've learned a lot, so please enjoy. Hi, we're here with Mark Wessels, um, percussionist, uh, teacher, publisher, web designer, uh, Vic Firth extraordinaire. Uh, thank you, Mark, for being here. Man of many hats. <laughs> Man of many hats. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be here. So first I want to start off with, uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in the middle of nowhere, West Texas, a little town called San Angelo, Texas, which is like, you have to, you have to uh, base your distance from Dallas, which is about four hours west. <laughs> And it's getting into the Permian Basin where, you know, like oil fields and uh, middle of Odessa and not a lot of music unless you played country. So <laughs> I grew up playing country music. I did country music. I, I, yeah. I enjoyed those gigs, actually. Yeah. Um, so when did you first uh, get introduced into music? Uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's kind of a family thing. I had an older brother that had a rock band, you know, and I, from the time that I remember, he played organ or, you know, keys uh, back in those days. And I was really little. He's a lot older than I am. But all I can remember is just sitting behind the drum set player, you know, the guy playing drums and just like, I don't even remember not wanting to play drums. I don't even remember not knowing that this is what I was going to do this for my entire life. You know, it was just one of those things that is like, you know, and of course my parents try to talk me out of it, but you know, <laughs> you know how that goes when you have a kid that really wants to do something. So yeah, I did that, you know, high school band, college, all of that stuff. Good. Uh, what were your musical influences? Well, early on, I was primarily that guy, you know, I, I did, uh, you know, I took a lot of lessons when I was little, we, we had a couple of drum, drum set teachers in town and, you know, some that played that went to college, you know, one of them went to North Texas and was uh, a drum set student at North Texas. I'm not sure what lab band he played in, but he was a pretty big influence early on, on diversifying, you know, my brother played in kind of a you know, like your typical uh, 70s band that played your Grand Funk Railroad and, you know, all of the, all of the kind of just standard rock tunes and, and, you know, and I grew up and the only gigs you could really get unless you had a band were, were kind of country gigs, you know, so played a lot of country music, which is definitely good for your time, you know, <laughs> Sim simplicity and developing your time because, I played with a lot of older guys, you know, growing up because they had bands and, you know, like they needed a drummer and you had to go in with perfect time. You know, there's no metronome. You didn't play with a click or anything. You just had to, you know, take your abuse, <laughs> learn from your mistakes, that kind of thing. But then, you know, once I got into high school, it was more of a marching band, uh, drum corps type of experience that I kind of went into and then, the whole world of percussion so you know both with mallets and timpani and but drum corps was a pretty heavily heavy influence early on so then i marched drum corps uh you know played snare drum and drum corps and then that kind of took over my life for a little while doing a lot of judging and teaching in drum corps and and, and uh you know writing and all that kind of stuff so kind of you know like a little bit of everything and that's my next question is the school music program. Did you have symphonic, classical, concert band? I know you did uh, the, the um, marching. Did you do jazz band or theater? 
pit orchestra? Yeah, we did a lot of, you know, like in high school, we had a jazz band. We had a really good jazz band because our, our band director was, you know, heavily into jazz. So that was a real focus of the program other than the marching band. So, you know, like I had a, a great jazz uh, drum set teacher and, you know, for West Texas anyway. Um, and, you know, like we were really focused on a lot of just bassy and, you know, like a lot of the standard, standard real swing stuff, you know, a little bit of Latin, a little bit of that kind of stuff. Uh, through high school, that was, that was a really big focus. So we had all of that, you know, just in the school setting, you know, Texas has some pretty good, good bands, you know, and then got into the whole all state auditions and, you know, playing timpani and marimba and all of that. So I just kind of wanted to be a well-rounded everything kind of guy. So I went to college at UT Arlington and then North Texas and kind of focused a little bit more on my concert percussion, you know, because that was, that was going to be a focus of mine. I was really trying to be a college teacher, but uh, those gigs don't pay a lot. So, <laughs> um, you know, like, especially right out of the gate. So I just, uh, I just went from, from college into teaching public school. Okay. And uh, did you have musical mentors or uh, mentors otherwise growing up? Uh, just, uh, you know, like you have teachers and then you have, even back then you have the, the, you know, the influences of, you know, the video and, and records that we had, you know, that, that was a huge influence. And then when I finally moved to Dallas into a big, bigger city, I could actually see people play, you know, um, I had some really good instructors. They were all really fundamental to me, but you know, for whatever reason, I was never really, no, I, I got to a point where I realized that I wasn't going to go down a performance route. I was really going to be more of an educator. So then it just became, you know, the experience of, of teaching and, and getting out and, and students and experimenting and doing things and, and trying to make them better. So I play a little bit, you know, I, I had, I have the chops because <laughs> all the drum corps experience and all of that, you know, I have, I have a lot of hand chops. My drum set is, is okay. Um, you know, like as you do in North Texas, it's adequate for North Texas, you know, I'm certainly not going to play in any lab bands anytime soon, but, um, you know, I, a pretty well-rounded, you know, experience overall. So did you, um, you received a, a, a degree in, in, um, in, in music or? Uh, yeah, it was music, music education. Music I didn't education. go the performance route. I mean, you know, and here in Texas, it's one of those, if you go performance and you finish with a degree in performance, there's not a lot you can do with it. If you have a degree in education, then, you know, obviously you're certified to teach uh, in the Texas school system. There were, at the time I, I went in, there were not any percussion teachers in the schools. And I got one of the first full-time, you know, full-time percussion jobs at a high school, which also, you know, basically established a percussion program in the, in the high school and middle schools and that kind of stuff. Now it's pretty regular in Texas. Most, almost every high school has a dedicated percussion instructor that teaches, you know, the, the drum line and the percussion ensembles and then the, uh, the beginners, all the intermediate students, you know, as they're coming up. So that was, that was pretty early on. And then um, when you, you got a teaching job, uh, were you teaching high school, college, uh, junior high school, elementary school? Yeah, it was, um, it was a high school situation I was a high school band director you know uh which I had one clarinet class I had to teach and I had a band class that I had to teach but most of my day was teaching beginners at one intermediate school and beginners at another intermediate school and then the high school percussion program so you know it was almost a full-time percussion job but between high school and middle school I never really did elementary music or anything like that. 
too many little sticks and things you got to play with, you know, <laughs> and, couldn't handle uh, the little kids. <laughs> so you did that for many years, right? And then you had left? Yeah, I did. Um, I taught for, well, 12 years, maybe 12 to 15 years in the public schools. I, I taught as a percussion, you know, like just a private lesson teacher. You know, I would go to schools or I had a studio that, that people would, uh, students would come to me, uh, you know, like during college and then right out of college. So, you know, it was, it was pretty much a, you know, full time, just picking up gigs and, and I played with a few symphonies and, you know, that was, uh, went on ensemble and different, different organizations that I could make gig money doing, but primarily made my living off of teaching students and then finally got the full-time band directing, you know, salary job from a school district. So yeah, that was, that was quite a long time. I mean, as I was doing that, I, I was writing books and, and I started a website really, really early on uh, at the, at the very beginning of the internet, <laughs> You know, when the internet wasn't a thing, uh, I had started a website and that, that kind of got the attention of Vic first because at the time, no manufacturers had websites. So, you know, here, all the, all the, between Vic Firth and Zildjian and Remo and all of the names that, you know, you, you know, you don't think of them not having a website but that was so new that they saw this developing and said, Oh, we need a website, you know? And I was one of the guys that kind of knew how to do that at the time. <laughs> now, how did you, um, this, this is kind of a turn. You, you started uh, getting into uh, uh, HTML and learning all that. Uh, yeah, how, it was, how uh, all it was, did you learn this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> it was a weird timing. Mean, like the, the whole, I've always been one of those guys that just like, if I need to learn something to do what I want to do, I'll just learn it. You know, uh, at the time, like early on, I bought my first computer, like the, the early Macintosh. This was kind of before the desktop publishing year. So, you know, I spent $15,000 on a computer, uh, a laser printer and Finale 1.0 and uh, Adobe PageMaker program. I spent fifteen thousand dollars on this thing, and and I wasn't really a computer nerd or anything. I didn't know much about computers. I just knew that this was going to be the thing, you know. And I already had a book that I had written, you know, a lot of manuscript and a lot of typewritten typewritten stuff, you know, and I'd done all of that. But you know, I just kind of knew, wow, this this is going to be huge. So I did whatever it took to, to learn how to use, I mean, if you use Finale at all, you know, <laughs> it's insane now, but it was crazy back then what you had to learn to, uh, to make anything happen on a computer, like writing music or anything. But, you know, so I just dove into that and I, I had a couple of books that I was self-publishing and a friend of mine went, you know, you, you ought to check out this website stuff, you know, like this is a free way to advertise. And, you know, like I didn't know anything about the internet, you know, there weren't hardly any websites, you know, there were kind of AOL, <laughs> you know, you could have a personal, almost like a MySpace page, but you know, like it was really, really clunky, really, really hard. You had to, you had to learn HTML, you had to program, you know, and I saw what could be done with it and just went, wow, this could be a thing, you know, this, this whole internet could be a thing. So anyway, yeah, I just, you know, got a few books and started learning how to code and, you know, took it from there. So you taught yourself. Oh yeah. I've taught myself everything. I'm, I'm kind of that, I'm not a master of anything, but I'm pretty good at a lot of things. So, you know, it's just like video editing and, audio engineering and you know like all of this stuff you have to know a little at least enough to be functional if you want to you know if you want to survive <laughs> i mean i know i know some people who are absolutely amazing at one thing you know and they're and if you're like what the top of your game in one thing that's great but you're also competing with all of the other people who are the top of their game 
at whatever that is. You know, do you want to play Latin? Well, you're going to compete against everybody else that plays Latin. You know, like if you want to be that specific, that's great, but you better be really, really, really good at it. Otherwise, you know, hey, you need to adapt and you need to, you know, figure out, oh, I can get a gig doing this. Oh, I need to learn that to, you know, to expand my gig or to, to do more. And you just have to well, adapt and roll with it. If you want to do music, <laughs> you know, yeah, we're not talking about, you, not you, talking about engineering or something where it's like, yeah, I can, yeah. I can learn this and then get a gig for the rest of my life. I'm set, you know? So that, that's what you do is you adapt it to a bunch of different things happening. Um, you're writing books. Um, you're figuring out, well, if I want to write a book, I, I need to get this uh, hardware and software figured out. Um, I had a band director, my high school band director, uh, worked for Passport, and he, and he had a program called Encore, uh, which was actually really easy to use. And um, so it was, it was like, we're, we're trying to figure that out, but it was very crude at the time. And, and uh, my father didn't let me do, buy a Mac. He wanted me to buy a PC. So we got uh, what was called Cakewalk, and we got uh, you know Encore, which was given to me by one of my students. Right. Um, but it was it, like I said, it was a lot easier to figure out. Um, I, I since then I have Sibelius, which is a lot harder. It takes a lot more, um, you know, uh, figuring out. I had to go to one of my guitar players and sit down with him, and he had to show it to me. <laughs> right. Uh, it's not right. very. It's it's not. Uh, what would you say? Intuitive. You know, user yeah. friendly. And that's the thing about every, everything, you know, like if it was easy, everybody would do it. You know, I mean, there's a, no matter what you do, there's a, a bar that you have to cross, you know, just even, even philosophically, like I have to, I have to learn how to do this. I mean, it's just like, if you sat down behind a drum set and you, you know, you've never played Latin or you've never done jazz. I mean, there is a bar there for you to become a jazz player. You know, there is a bar there if you want to become a Latin player. And you might have some fundamental skills, you know, depending on whether, you know, like now I work in Adobe uh, uh, Premiere constantly. I do uh, Logic. I do, you know, like I do all of these things. And there's always that bar that you have to like, you just have to know that I have to learn this good enough to do what I want to do, you know. So <laughs> it, there's always an entry point where you have to, you just have to suck it up and, you know, figure it out. So uh, at what point did you uh, start working for Vic Firth? So you had gone through school, you've, you've taught school, um, you know, you, you started publishing books. Um, he saw your web design and, and asked you to, to come on board or how did that work? Yeah, that was one of those, um, I mean, it's kind of a serendipitous moment. You know, it's just, uh, I was on the education team for Vic. Right after they started it, Neil Larrabee uh, started an education program at Vic Firth. And I was one of the first educators because I was doing drum corps and Neil, and we knew each other from those, from those days. And then, so I joined the education team and there was only like 20 of us, I think, initially. And uh, so you know, like I would see him at uh, PAS or, you know, the typical, all the shows, the different shows, Midwest, TMEA and all, all of those things. And we, you know, hang out a lot uh, at what, at the point where my website was becoming really successful was the point where Vic was saying, you know, we need a website. And I think that they, they tried hiring a couple of, you know, web designers back then. They were usually high school kids that kind of figured it out you know, and paid a lot of money and got a really terrible website. And, you know, I said, Vic, that's, that's terrible. Like, and he, he said, Oh, you think you could do better? And I went, yeah, I could do a lot better. And then next thing I know, I'm working for Vic full time, you know, and it was a lot more than my teaching salary. So, and I got to stay at home, you know, like back, this was 2000. Uh, so back in 2000, the whole work from home thing was not kind of a, wasn't really a thing <laughs> you know that was very new but I wasn't willing to move to Boston I live in the Dallas area so 
they said, well, you, you know, there's no reason why you can't do what you do from, from your house. So that's when I started. And then you've been there ever since, right? Yeah. And it, you know, like my official job is now I'm the director of education for the Zildjian company. Um, but I was the website designer and director of internet activities for Vic when I first started, you know, we, we did all of those. Uh, I did all of those things from the early time, you know, like I developed the rudiment poster and the rudiments online and the web rhythms. And then I worked with Tommy Igo on developing the groove essentials before it became a Hudson music thing. So we had all of these just educational projects that we were doing through Vic Firth and kept growing, growing. Eventually uh, Zildjian purchased Vic as a company and I became a Zildjian employee, but we kind of kept things separate for a long time. And then, you know, just in the last three years, we've had a kind of a, a uh, reorganization of the marketing department. And, and that's, so now I'm full-time for a while. I was marketing director for the Vic Firth company or digital marketing director for Vic Firth. And, and then, you know, through different things, it, my focus now is just on education. So I do all the, uh, the BF jams, the, I'm in the middle of doing Stanton Moore's transcription from his Zildjian Live, you know, like uh, a ton of stuff like that. So it's a lot of fun. Wow. Sounds like you got your hands full there. Yeah. <laughs> Never a dull moment. There's always, there's, there's always a, uh, a deadline coming up, you know, so. Um, so did uh, Neil leave? And because I, I, I always tell the story, Vic did a, um, we had a, a clinic here. I'm, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. And it was uh, David Garibaldi who lives down the street. He lives uh, a couple of towns over. And um, Dom Flambriaro and um, Vic, and they had a big, um, uh, it was like a uh, teacher's conference over here right. in, in South San Francisco. And um, it was kind of the highlight. Everybody came out, you know, yeah. and, and Neil was there and he was real nice. He gave me a bunch of stuff. Um, and, and Vic was just he was the nicest guy, you know, and he, he came up to, all, we, we had like a conference room and he, he came up to everybody and, you know, thank you for coming. And it was such a great, he was such a gentleman. Yeah. And, um, and, and, um, you know, everybody gave up, gave experiences, you know, and Dom had his, he was, had this thing he wrote out on a plane of his theories, you know, and a lot of energy. I don't know if you have um, hung out with him, but, you know, he just got oh. this, this, this powerhouse of energy and, and presentation. And, and then David talked about his books and, um, and how he got into doing it. Um, so, um, getting into your book publishing how did that happen and your your books are excellent so you published how many books uh right now i have four method books and then i have a theory workbook thing for for ban you know like overall but you know i think it started off just like almost every teacher that you know that <laughs> You know, I'm using this book and this book and this book and this book. You know, you have little pieces that you, you know, pull from stick control and, and you know, syncopation. And then maybe I use, uh, you know, Funky Primer or I use Garibaldi's book or I use a little bit of everything. So, you know, like my kids were walking around with this stack of stuff, you know. <laughs> and it was like, you know, this is, this is crazy because I'm picking and choosing what I want for them, you know, like in, in my own curriculum, how I want them to go from point A to point B. Um, in, in, in a lot of books, it's really tough to, you know, like really go in your direction that you want to go in because the book was written for a specific thing. You know, if you're, if you're doing Garibaldi's book or doing any other book, it's written for a very specific thing, but you might have a different idea. So, you know, very, very early on, I think I was 23 or 24, I just started writing my own exercises, you know, like, okay, we're going to do, you know, this part of this book. And then I want you to, 
you know, work on these exercises, but you also need reading. So we're going to do some of these and, but I need to write some more and I need to write some more. So I was doing a lot of that. And finally, I just, I had this notebook <laughs> that we would just go to Kinko's and copy all of my stuff, you know, with just a few exercises from this and this and this. And then finally I just went, this is silly. I might as well just write a book, you know? So that was when I was like 23, 24 teaching. And it just kind of progressed as you learn how to teach and you get better at what you do and you get more, you know, the longer you teach, the more you know what you want, you know, early on, it's pretty much just regurgitating what your teacher taught you. Right. And then, you know, like the longer you start teaching, you find out what works, what doesn't work, what, you know, and, and then you start developing your own curriculum of how you want your students to progress. So, you know, eventually it just came down to that. So, and then, you know, it, it, the self-publishing thing allowed me to, every year I would use a book and then I would just fix it. <laughs> you know, I'd just change it. You know, it, it wasn't stuck into anything because I didn't take it to a publisher and go, here, I want to publish my book. You know, which if I would have done, probably would have failed miserably, you know, because <laughs> every year you use it, you learn something else. You want to you want to fix your method. You want to fix your curriculum to, to make sure that students are learning the best. So I think with my my snare drum book, it's probably like the 10th edition of it. And it just kind of grew and grew and grew over over years and then wrote a mallet book and then a drum set book and then uh, work with another educator to write a, a marimba four mallet book, you know, so still doing a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. I, uh, I have a real problem with a lot of books with curriculum. So that's a good point. And um, just um, almost going from point A to point B to point C. Um, I always feel that the books jump around too much. Um, they go to a rhythm that the kids, they, they just can't get, you know, it's just too hard for them. So I have to go back because a lot of books will have, let's say syncopation, they'll have that at the end of the book, right? But then you see some other books where they're starting it like right away, you know, lesson three or something. So yes. I always try to go through a few books that really start with, you know, the, the very beginning and, and working through, um, you know, basics and then point B where they start to get a little bit more immediate before they get to the advanced. And that's one thing I like about your snare drum book is it really does start off with, you know, the rudiments, the rolls and the flams. I try to get my students into this. You do have your stickings written out they have problems. It's like, I have to follow the stickings. And I go, well, this is really meant for you to be alternating and to uh, get away from doing a, a, what I call um, uh, your dominant hand lead, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think your books do really well and the snare drum books specifically and that uh, aspect. You're really giving them, like, this is a way that you can form it with dynamics and, uh, and stickings and rudiments. Right, right. Yeah, and it's a... Uh... You know, like there's so many different, um, uh, everybody's got their own way of doing things. So that, you know, like the, and, and you know, whenever you write a book, you write a method, you know, you're going to have people that either agree with it or people that disagree, you know, like, and, and no matter what you do, whether you write all the stickings in or don't write any stickings in, you're going to have some people that say, I really wish you would have written the stickings in, you know, like it's really in the world that the snare drum book lives primarily in the Texas or the band world, they really have to work on that right hand lead or dominant hand lead system because, you know, they're going in a marching band. They have to, all of those rhythm patterns have to be, you know, like pretty ingrained in, in what they do, you know, which is where that came from. But, you know, like I always, I always did, I mean, really, non-dominant hand lead is where you push the kids say okay take that but lead with the left you know do that so you can develop your non-dominant hand or the alternating approach where you just don't don't even worry about sticking and you just alternate everything but i always just found that you know students don't read quite as well and quite as quickly when they don't have a you know a systematic sticking approach 
you know, like if you're if you're playing you know, if you're playing really syncopated rhythms like that, um, it becomes more of a mental uh, challenge than it does if you have a sticking system written out or that, that you just know it's almost a muscle memory at that point when you're reading something very quick. It's just I know I know how this feels in my hand, so I'm just going to do that, you know. Yeah, I, when I grew up, um, there was a guy named Anthony Cerrone. I don't know if you ever heard of him. And he, uh, oh, yeah. when I was probably, I was probably in seventh or eighth grade. My my teachers were jazz players, uh, and I had one. My first teacher was a classical percussionist, and my second teacher was a jazz player. And um, my first teacher took me to see Anthony Cerrone, you know, at some percussion. It was might have been a performance or something. But we worked out of his book, um, Portraits and Rhythm. And um, that was my favorite book. It's very challenging. But the thing with that book is you always had to come up with your own stickings, you know. And, um, and I always tell my students that um, more of the classical end, it's, it's interpreting and what works best for you. And of course they had these insane tempos and uh, time changes and, you know, meter changes and insane rhythms and, and um, uh, you know, rudiments and whatnot. But I always taught, try to tell my students, try to come up with a way that you can do it that works for you. Of course we had to perform, this is our part of our juries, both in um, high school and in Berkeley too, Berkeley College of Music, they use that as well. So, um, and I found out later he wrote that book when he was like 20, 22 years old. Um, and, and um, you know, and a lot of his, his studies were really great for classical percussions, but I always try to differentiate that um, some of the marching, because I do have some students that are in uh, uh, marching bands like uh, Blue Devils and whatnot, their stickings have to be exact. And then the, some of the classical, it's, it's kind of up to the... Um, up to the the uh performer so maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit yeah and you know like having spent time with vic um you know one of the one of the legendary timpanists of all time you know with the boston symphony to him stickings did not matter whatsoever you know it's all about sound and he actually studied from george lawrence stone <laughs> you know that's how that's how far back that goes. And he said, you know, like the stone was such an incredible uh, uh, stickler on the individual sound of every single stroke. You know, that whole first page of stick control book, you know, was, was Vic's rudiments. And he, he kept saying, you don't need the rudiments. You just need the first page of stick control. And hey, you got everything, you know. And it was like, play it fast, play it slow, play it loud, play it soft, do dominion windows, do, you know, like, in, and if you can make your strokes sound completely even, then you actually have control of your, of your hands, you know? So the, the whole orchestral approach, um, and there are more and more or orchestral players who come out of, you know, at least a systematic drum corps or marching band type approach. And they adapted, you know, if you look at, Jacob Nisley or, you know, like some amazing chops that guys in the symphonies have now. They used to not have those kind of chops, but, you know, like, um, so it really is about developing the muscles and developing the coordination and then taking that to another level of being able to shape musical phrases and make sound happen because you have control versus the opposite way of just saying, this is the right sticking for every single thing that you do, you know? I mean, you kind of have to learn something before you, you know, before you turn it loose. <laughs> you know, like a, a great painter, you know, uh, Cezanne or, or somebody had to do the basics before they got to the level of painting masterpieces. And it's the same with, you know, almost all of the musicians you know, that I, that I know, or the drummers that I know, they, they started somewhere, they have some really good background, very few of them have no facility before they create, create art, you know. Well, it's great points. Um, so you're uh, working on a new website, 
um, a teaching course. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about um, what that's going to entail, a subscription site, um, and maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, this is, um, you know, I mean, it, we're in this time where people have are having to learn from home. They're having to learn remotely. Um, and we've been going in this direction anyway, you know, with sites like Drumeo and, and other, other teaching websites. Um, but, you know, to me, it's because I'm surrounded by educators, I'm surrounded by lessons. And you look at YouTube and you, you know, you type in drum lesson or whatever, and you're going to get 70,000 videos of different lessons on here, learn this groove, learn this fill, learn this, learn it, you know, like it's just kind of all over the place. So it's even, you know, like we find that books are kind of chaotic because they don't do exactly what you need to make it, you know, like a systematic way of learning. So, you know, that's in my, uh, you know, like time is the director of education. I've done a million lessons with a million guys on, you know, on the Vic Firth site and, you know, constantly I'm around amazing players and everything. But, you know, what, what strikes me is that younger students, especially, you know, like the beginning levels and the very intermediate, they need to have a systematic approach so that, that they can go from point A to point B, not only so that they can maximize their practice time, but also because it minimizes it, frustration. You know, if, if your teacher hands you something or you, you see a groove on YouTube, you know, like I'm working on this Stanton Moore transcription from Zildjian Live. I mean, if you took a kid and said, here, learn that, you know, there's a serious amount of frustration that happens. So, you know, with my, uh, with my drum set book, Stanton is actually a good friend of mine. I had written a drum set book and... Uh, I was in the middle of recording my own lessons with the drum set and I had a house fire and, you know, like lost everything uh, several yeah. years ago. Yeah. I mean, like burn everything gone. So I was in the middle of having to, you know, deal with all of that. At the same time, I wanted to have lessons and, you know, like I approached Stanton, I said, Hey, would you want to do this? You know, You're like, yeah, man, I'll do that. So he recorded all the lessons for my drum book and it goes, the drum set book kind of is like my snare drum book. It, it's very methodical. It does technique, it does grooves, it does, you know, st styles, it has play along tracks and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, we have all of those, you know, 16 hours of lessons with Stanton on that. And then I did my own lessons with the, uh, the fresh approach to snare drum book, which Basically, what I thought is, you know, like kids practice, and I've had the benefit of having two kids who play drums. Uh, my daughter played for a while. My son still plays. But, you know, like they were most effective when I was standing there practicing with them. <laughs> if I said, just go practice, they wouldn't really know what to practice or what to do. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a lesson and I'm going to do three 30-minute practice sessions on the lesson. You know, we're going to warm up together. We're going to do technique and rudiments. And then I'm going to show you how to read these things. I'm going to put the music on the screen. I'm going to have the, you know, the, the little follow the bouncing dot thing, you know, so that you can see where you're at in each measure. And then I'm going to, you know, so basically I'll practice with you for, you know, an hour and a half and then you'll have that lesson down, you know, and then we'll move on to the next lesson, you know, so my lessons on the snare drum book are just like that. So a student can just log on and grab their sticks and just start playing along and just follow the music and learn from me, you know, just like I was standing over their shoulder while they're practicing. So that's kind of how that works. <laughs> At least that's my concept. So it's, it's snare, it's from the book, uh, snare drum and it's drum set and you have marimba and um, uh, mallets too. Yeah, yeah. The see, uh, one of my former students, uh, it, people in the concert percussion world would know David Skidmore. He's with the uh, Third Coast Percussion. Uh, I taught him when he was in high school as a band director to him. And he went on and went to Northwestern with Michael Burt and then went to Yale College of Music with 
with Bob Van Sice and then established this uh, really well-known percussion uh, ensemble in Chicago. They, you know, perform percussion music all the time. Anyway, he and I have been really close for a long time and he's a fantastic murder player and a really good composer. So we kind of talked back and forth and I had this concept of him writing, you know, the technique of learning four mallets, but kind of like what we do in drum set, you have to know this to be able to play this groove, to be able to play this style of music. So that's what he did. He went through and wrote, uh, you know, 24 etudes that are progressive, but each one focuses on a technique and a, a very specific thing you have to have to master to be able to play music. But then the focus on the music and not just the technique, you know, because that's where a lot of, you know, like a lot of teachers fall to me is that they get so focused on the technique, learning this, you know, it could be a rudiment, it could be a, you know, like for four mallets, you know, it could be a permutation. It could be a, a groove or whatever. You learn that. Okay. Check it off the list. Go to the next. But really it's not about that at all. It's to learn that so that you can play music, you know, it has nothing to do with learning technique for technique's sake as that's just a skill you need to play music. Now play music, you know? So that's kind of what that book is focused on. And it's got, He's got lessons all the way through his book. Wow. So um, when is all this launching? Uh, well, today I'm hoping. <laughs> uh, it is a, uh, it's been a work in progress. Um, yeah, it, you know, I actually have a friend that's a web developer that I'm, you know, working with. There's, there's certain limitations to what I can do. I can learn it, but I don't have time to learn it. So he's doing all the, the back end work uh, and we're launching that. So it's, it's one of those, you know, typical subscription websites. You pay a monthly fee and you get access to everything, you know, which is kind of nice because people progress at different rates and, you know, and like with us, with the uh, drum set book, you know, it, it goes from, day one beginner and here's how you hold your stick all the way up through Afro Cuban and world styles and, you know, jazz and all of that. So being able to, to, you know, take lessons from Stan or at least get that perspective, you know, as I'm working on something, I think is, you know, pretty valuable. Wow. That's pretty incredible. So you've been busy with all this stuff, right? You've been killing yourself just trying to get it all done. I'm never, it's never ending for me, you know, like, and as soon as I'm done with that, I'll move on to the next, you know. <laughs> and so all this is done in, in uh, Adobe Premiere. That's where you do all your software and, and then all the other guys are recording the audio in their studios. Well, actually, all of the stuff is recorded in my, almost everything was recorded in my media room. <laughs> I had Stan, when we built a new house, I have a kind of a studio slash media room. Cause I don't, you know, like I don't record full time. So it's really our, it's our TV media room. And then we clear everything out and, you know, Stanton came over for a couple of weeks and we just, for two weeks solid, we just recorded nonstop. And I've been doing the same thing with my own stuff is, you know, clear everything out, set myself up and then, you know, record these lessons with mine. It was like, Oh my God, there's like 72 hours of lessons. You know, there's, <laughs> there's three lessons per lesson. There's three 30 minute lessons per lesson and there's 20 lessons. So, you know, do the math. And you did that yourself? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I set up cameras and I have all the stuff. So I just set it up, hit record. And I, you know, I think I do better when nobody's helping me, you know, that way I can mess up as much as I, I want to, <laughs> I don't have to worry about what somebody's thinking about me. I can just, you know, I can go through a whole lesson and go like, that was terrible. And just redo it and not have anybody go like, ah, oh, that was a waste of time, you know? <laughs> so that uh, is a lot of editing, right? From that point when you do the many hours of, of video footage and, uh, oh, my brother, you don't even know. <laughs> you yeah, well, don't I'm, even know. I'm, I'm going through it too. And, I'm, you know, I've got, I've bought so many hard, hard drives and new equipment and uh, cameras and 
Um, and then, yeah, something will go wrong and, and camera will go wrong or a microphone or, you know, <laughs> something. And then I do it again. Yep. Kind of keep the stuff so I can look at it and, and say, well, hey, I made some good points there, but the, the microphone's buzzing, you know, so I can't use that. Oh, so, I, um, I was working on a, a lesson I was doing for Zildjian and I loaded the audio tracks, you know, like when you're doing it by yourself, you don't have anybody monitoring anything. And, you know, the lav mic just completely fizzled out, you know, like it had some kind of in interference. And so that entire lesson that I recorded, you know, luckily this is not going live on anything. So I can just use the audio from the GoPro, but you know, like stuff like that just happens and you just kind of, just kind of have to roll with it, you know? Yeah. And and go back and you make a, I would say, like, try to, to look at your footage before you start to work on it. That's what I try. I, le I learn as I go. I learn from my mistakes. And then right. I go back. <laughs> I, I, I know you help me a lot with, with when I try to do stuff. And, uh, you know, you, you need to get better lights. You need to take your microphone stands down. You need to get a, a lav mic, um, you know talk about this don't don't worry about every word you're talking you know or, or your your um your conversation make sure that that you know you're getting the point across i i try to do that in the lessons but at the same time i try to make it real professional and right. if i hear something wrong it bugs me and i'll go back and i'll try <laughs> to fix it right um but like you it's it's many takes you know hours and hours of takes and many hard drives so <laughs> right everything yeah. Um, so what is your uh, current job at Vic Firth? Are you still are you still uh, working full time? Are you working part time now? Uh, or is it Zik, is it Zildjian and Vic Firth? Is yeah, it's it's all um, all education for the Zildjian company, which includes Vic Firth, you know, so uh, I do what I'm focused on right now. I mean, it, it kind of depends on uh, where we're at we have we have several projects in the works you know and we're, we're trying we try to do everything to hit you know like all of our demographics because we have drum set players at different levels you know we have the beginner level players who are you know learning how to play we have really high-end players who want to you know like learn from you know the, the highest end people we have rock we have jazz we have you know like and so and the same thing goes with, we have marching guys, you know, like the guys who are in Blue Devils or, or you know, Santa Clara or you know, it, it, many different drum corps. They want to learn things that apply to what they're doing. And the same, th same thing for concert guys. So we, luckily with my background, I can, I can do all of that, you know, and that's why it's so important to, <clears throat> to be well-rounded. If I was just a drum set guy, no way could I be doing in the lot videos at DCI and, and doing the transcriptions for, you know, for people to read the snare drum music on the screen. Cause it's so freaking complex, you know, and if I couldn't do marimba and all of that, then I couldn't do any of the concert stuff that I do. So, you know, my, my current projects are, we're, we're actually developing a Zildjian drum method, um, which we're going to do with multiple artists, uh, and putting together a, you know, and this is years, a years long project. You know, the first thing is I wrote the drum method and we're going to, you know, like record, I recorded all of my, the videos just as a demonstration. And then we're going to get artists to come in and record the lesson. So it's going to be a multiple, you know, multiple artists doing multiple things, you know, and, and trying to really go after the, uh, enlarging the drum community. So it's not really targeting the student who's already studying with you. It's targeting the many, many kids out there who want to play drums, who, you know, don't have a teacher or don't, their parents don't want them to play because it's loud or it's expensive or, you know, like, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff where we just play with our hands on our legs because you know, you can learn coordination and you can learn all kinds of stuff. You can do things with a practice pad and a stick that don't even apply, you know, that. So there's a lot of that uh, on the, you know, like I still do all of the transcriptions. I don't do the transcriptions, but I prepare all the transcription videos for 
uh, the Zildjian Live. Um, we do interviews constantly with different guys on different subjects. We're, we have a mallet poster that's coming out for the Vic Firth, you know, for school band kind of learning your scales. We've got, uh, I've developed some rhythm cards for, you know, like just for teachers to use to, to shuffle them up and throw rhythms out on the stand and, you know, help sight reading. So it's just a lot of different educational projects that I do. And then, you know, like also doing, uh, doing ed product education, you know, like what, what, <laughs> what creates symbol sounds, what, you know, how, how does whatever affect the, the feel of a stick and all of those type of things are education too. So a lot of stuff. Wow. So, um, what advice could you give to, um, young musicians um, starting out in the music business. And, and I say that in a broad sense because you're a really uh, inspirational example of all these different things you can do. Um, you know, you, you, you started out doing one thing, but you branched out and you learned all these things at the, uh, you know, infancy of the internet. So uh, what kind of advice can you give to uh, younger musicians or entrepreneurs? Well, I do think that you know, it, you have to, you have to kind of go inside, uh, you know, like you need to take some really deep self-reflection on how much do you want to do this, you know, because music is not easy. As you know, it's, it's not something you fall into. You can't become a rock star just because you want to be, you know, you can't become a really successful teacher unless you really want to be, you know, like, and, and that's just a philosophy that I have is that unless you really want something, you're not going to become a success at it. So you need to decide, do I really want to do this? And if I really want to do this, what do I need to do to get me where I need to go? Now, not everybody wants to be, you know, a director of education. Not everybody wants to be a publisher. Not everybody wants to work on video full time or in a, you know, some people have things that they really gravitate towards, you know? So the first step is, all right, this is my main focus. You know, I, I want to be a studio engineer, you know, like I, I love playing, but you know, like I probably am not going to be a player. I want to be an engineer. All right. You need to go deep, you know, and it needs to not only be your, you know, what you do for a living, it needs to be your hobby, it needs to be your love, it needs to, you know, like, it needs to consume you. And almost everything that you do in music has is, is that way where you get consumed with it. You know, like, there is no nine to five with us. I don't, I'm sure you're the same way. There is no nine to five. I think music, I live music, I breathe music, you know. Um, so whatever your main focus is, you need to go deep and you need, there are no restrictions on what you can learn and how much you can learn. So don't, you know, don't put the blame on anybody else that I can't do it because I don't have access to this. Oh, I don't have this. I don't have this. I'm not going to the best school, you know, like you literally have everything at your fingertips, you know? So then it's just a matter of, you know, and it's the same thing, whether you want to be a player or not, it, you know, the greatest players have this desire and who was I talking about with this? <laughs> I just did an interview with somebody and this was their main point is that, you know, the desire is what transcends your ability. You know, like there, oh, it's Mark DiCiani, which, you know, we're talking about music in the brain and what the brain will allow, you know, like, are there talents or they're not talents? And he's absolutely, no, you know, like the, the, the person who questions why, the person who wants to learn is the person who's ultimately successful at it, you know? So that's what I say. And then along the way, you, you know, if you're a studio engineer, then there are so many things you could learn very easily about lighting and camera work that supplement what you do, you know, like kind of do things. If you're a teacher, you absolutely have to learn how to record yourself. 
absolutely have to learn video editing. You absolutely have to learn, you know, social media. You have to, you know, you have to learn all these things. You can't just, you know, put up a sign and expect people to flood your basement, you know, and, and become a really successful teacher. You have to do, you know, one step at a time. Don't worry about how enormous it is. You just have to take one project and tackle it. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Um, really great advice. And, um, you know, it's really uh, uh, amazing to actually get you here and, and um, do this interview. I totally appreciate it. Thank you so much for spending time. And I think a lot of people will really get a lot of value out of this. Great. Glad to be here. All right, Mark. So, um, you know, stay safe. Um, I guess you, you kind of work at home anyway, so you've been fine right right yeah <laughs> so it, it's a little stir crazy we're going on five months <laughs> i know I, I, I was you know in my job i was traveling you know probably two weeks out of the month i was somewhere either going to boston or going to you know drum shows uk drum show montreal you know like i was constantly in an airport traveling you know seeing people and all that and now it's just been you know five months of in your office I have my family, you know, yeah. so yeah, it's not just me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a different time. Uh, for me, it, it actually uh, was allowing me to, to focus on uh, me doing a drum course. And I, I, I had the concept a long, long ago, but to actually sit down and do it, uh, I had to force myself. And this actually, in a positive light, <laughs> gave me that that focus, you know, wrote everything out and then it started filming it. Filming it was the hardest part for me. Um, and and um, that takes so long, as you know. So um, so in a way, it was a very positive uh, time for me to sit down and do it. No excuses. I have right. to go to a gig. I have to do this. I have to travel here. I've got, you know, all these other things that kind of um, uh, distract me. It was a it was a, a time to focus. So. I look at it as a positive, but again, it'll take a while, probably I'd say another year or so before we're out of the woods. Yep. Yep. So uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. Fingers crossed is, you know, keep practicing. And, and, um, and like you said, oh, there's all these tools that we can take advantage of. All right, Mark. Well, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day and uh, I'll be in touch with you. All right. Great all right. to talk. All right. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Thank you so much for going through this video. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. Be sure to check out my website, robhartdrumstudio.com. And there I've compiled online music courses that I've used with my experience of a lifetime of playing and teaching music that cover counting and reading rhythms, hand and feet technique, groove independence, and much more. Until next time, happy practicing. Mm -hmm.